unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> oh, hello. Hello, everybody. I, I am having a frustrating time, but oh, thank you, Jesus. We're, it's working, finally. Uh, <clears throat> I've had some technical issues trying to uh, get everything up and rolling as usual. Uh, we're going through a transition. Uh, Matthias is hidden behind the scenes producing the program and we're trying to adjust to this new procedure. So that's why we're running a little late getting started. And I keep on having to leave and come back, uh, but uh, we're here. So let's carry on. This is the welcome to the Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. And first, let me just say to the uh, chat room, um, uh, those regular members uh, participating uh, in the congregation, thank you for joining us again. Uh, if you're here with us for the first time, welcome. And if you're a moderator, please make sure you look for these first timers and, and acknowledge them and welcome them. Uh, before we get into the study, our, if you get your Bibles ready, we're in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 1 tonight. And let's get started. But first, let me ask uh, Renee and Jason to introduce themselves. Start, uh, ladies first, sisters first. Go ahead. Thank you. Hey, guys. Happy to be here with you tonight in my robe. Just got back from the beach. I'm a little burned, so forgive my crazy looks. But I am so happy uh, to be here with you guys tonight. My channel is Renee Roland. Uh, I contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. And uh, Brother Luke affectionately called me the untwisted sister. I like to untwist scriptures that people take out of context to take away a believer's joy and um assurance uh and trust in christ or to add works in any way to, to get keep or prove salvation and um all of us here have the same foundational doctrine uh that's the basis for my channel so i'm uh excited to go into chapter three tonight thank you guys uh, awesome awesome well as you can tell this is a very casual uh congregation we can even we can even participate in our robes oh, damn it. Uh, if that was a white robe i could call it the robe of righteousness but it's uh, cool. i don't know what to say i'm on twisted sister i'm a rock star man rock stars walk around in robes all the time <laughs> all right uh, okay brother Cripps, say hi and tell them who you are please sure uh my name is jason Cripps, and i'm part of a show called true story live we come on sunday evenings at 9 p.m eastern standard time and uh we just uh talk about uh psych psychological sociological issues and uh, uh family stuff and relationships and things like that and uh, we have a uh a non-believer on the uh, panel uh that asks us questions so the rest of us try to answer the questions from a christian perspective and um, just discussions uh so we welcome everyone uh, even with uh, different beliefs uh to all come to the table and uh, i think we've shown that we can have discussions on uh harder topics and still treat each other with respect and dignity and uh it's worked out very very well uh but um, i'm also on this uh channel every wednesday and i'm uh, happy to be a part of this and also on uh, Talking Doctrine Monday nights with uh, Monday's Milk. So um, I'm happy to be here as always, and I'm excited also about the chapters. Hello to the chat too. Yes, uh, yes. and we've got uh, Brother Matthias with us, but he's uh, be, he'll be behind the scenes producing the program, uh, making it all possible and assisting us with uh, the uh, visual uh, part of the program. Uh, so, I ask you to subscribe to uh, all of these channels. Uh, you'll, you'll benefit by uh, subscribing to each one of them. Uh, all right, let's get started with the, the study. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 in the KJV reads, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Uh, I'm going to read that verse 2 with this. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. Okay, Sister Renee. Yeah, uh, I like this because it puts the whole chapter in context here. 
uh, he's basically telling them that he has to, I like the word carnal, that's where we get carnage and uh, carnivorous, it means meat. So carnal isn't always that you're walking in the flesh. Carnal means that you are in the flesh. We are just, we, we are act in actual meat. That's what we're dealing with. That's our physical state right now. And we're told to uh, walk after the spirit, not the flesh. Those in the flesh can't please God. That means those without the spirit of God can't please God. Those trying to earn it through performance can't please God. So when he says here, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So they are still um, in their flesh about some things. And these issues will be mentioned later on as we get into the word. They're not thinking in unity of the spirit, but thinking in a division of the flesh. So he's letting them know that the way they're thinking, which we'll see in a minute, is not uh, a place of spiritual unity, but they're still stuck in hierarchies of, of the flesh and of the world. So he's going to speak to them as because they haven't reached a level of spiritual maturity to understand spiritual things yet. That's what I believe. All right. Uh, and uh, I'll ask Brother Cripps to comment on one and two, but, but first let me just make a mention to the uh, chat room. <clears throat> um, I hope you'll follow along with this uh, as we go through the study <clears throat> and stay on the same subject as our discussion. But uh, if you do have a, a comment or a question about this subject tonight, uh, if you will post it in the chat room in all caps, uh, it'll be easy for me to recognize, and we'll try to respond to your uh, your statement, your questions. Uh, and there, I see something in all caps already here. So let me see uh, where is it. I just saw it. Sometimes stopping at the right time. Okay, is this talking about unbelievers, Renee? Uh, Renee, Renee, uh, she no. This is to believers. Yeah. Uh, but I'll, I'll let uh, I'll let uh, Brother Cripps uh, comment on one and two, and then we'll come back to that. Go ahead. Yep. Okay, um, can we pull the scripture back up? Because I was, I, I didn't. Uh, I'm, I'm counting on that to be able to see it. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so I agree with what Renee said, absolutely. And this is, I think, where the term "babes" in in Christ uh, kind of it. He's describing mere infants instead of babes in Christ. He's saying mere infants in the new life in Christ. How many of us are have been in that uh, place um, where the the milk of the word uh, should be uh, being digested and being fed. And, and, and Paul's giving an example here of what that looks like. Um, I like uh, Renee's uh, explaining what carnal means. Um, I think a lot of people get the wrong idea of what carnal means. They assume that it's, that it's uh, uh, always bad. It's not necessarily that way, but certainly in, in the context of the two chapters. Um, Paul's just saying, you know, you weren't ready for meat, so I fed you with milk. Um, that's that's what was necessary. To, and, and he says at the end, and this is kind of harsh, <laughs> even now you're still not ready. <laughs> um, at least Paul tells it like it is. You know, he he's not uh, mincing words with them, uh, so to speak. And um, I'm, I'm excited to, to see what else he has to say, but I'll stop there for now. Okay. Uh I really wanted to read the Amplified before you commented, uh, Brother Cripps, but let me read the Amplified in verse 1 and 2. And the Amplifies, uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, it it does what we're doing here. Uh, it, we read the KJV, and then we amplify it, which means we're commenting or expounding on it, giving our thoughts and our interpretation of the meaning of it. And the Amplified uh, translators, uh, they... They put their thoughts and their interpretations into the uh, the translation itself. So that's why it's called the Amplified. Uh, and and sometimes it's very helpful. Sometimes it's seriously wrong. So we, we, we compare it to the KJV. Uh, it says, however, brothers and sisters. So uh, if you look at the KJV, it says, and I, brethren. Uh, if, so the question was, is this talking to believers or non-believers? Uh, yeah, the very third word there, I and I, brethren, he's addressing it to brethren. He could be talking about, sometimes Paul says brethren, 
and he's talking about uh, fellow Jews when he's talking to a Jewish group, and it may not mean that they're believers in Jesus, they're just brethren in the Jewish sense. But in this case, he's talking to the church congregation, referring to them as brethren, and uh, so he says, brothers and sisters. However, brothers and sisters, I could not talk to you as to spiritual people, but only as to worldly people. That is dominated by human nature. Mere infants in the new life uh, in, in Christ. Uh, verse two is, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Even now you are still not ready. Uh, so I, I would say so there's an awful lot we could talk about the, the, these verses. We could probably just spend an hour on it actually. But I, when it says, um, I could not talk to you as to spiritual people. Uh, um, remember when uh, Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he, uh, he, said, he referred to him. And he wasn't even a believer at that time, but he's saying, you don't understand spiritual language when he was talking about being born again. And uh, Jesus kept on uh, acknowledging that a lot of people weren't understanding his message because they, they didn't understand spiritual language. Now these people are believers, they have the Holy Spirit, so they should be better to understand spiritual uh, language here, but they're immature, so they're not able to understand it really. Uh, and he says that when it says about being carnal, um, dominated by the human nature, or as in the KJV it says, um, but as unto carnal, even as to unto babes in Christ. Being carnal, um, carnal is really, a, uh, in Spanish, the word carne needs, means meat or flesh. And that's the root of this word. It's, it's really carnal just means you're in the flesh. You're not in the spirit. Uh, you're you're thinking as uh, the way the old band does before the, the your, your born again uh, change and experience. You're you're still thinking the same way as you used to in flesh, and so when he says uh, carnal, that's what he's talking about. When he says babes in Christ, you know we I can't repeat this enough uh, that when a person is born into this world naturally from his mother's womb. Uh, everyone that's born is is a, a human being, and there no one is more human than the other. But as we as we go through life, some of us grow into into maturity and productive life have productive lives to varying degrees. It's not universally you know, that everybody doesn't grow uh, succeed quickly. Some succeed slowly in life. Some don't seem to succeed in life very well at all. And it's the same thing with this new birth when we're born again spiritually. Uh, Paul's referring to as baby Christians. You were just recently born again, or maybe you just haven't matured yet. Uh, and uh, they have a long ways to go in terms of growing and, and understanding spiritual things and having the Holy Spirit transform their minds. Uh, so uh, he says they're not only, um, they, they, they're not ready. Again, the analogy of being uh, with, uh, on milk versus meat. That's just, a, just an illustration of a baby can't eat solid food. A baby has to start off on liquid food, milk. And, um, and then later on, when they're, when they're old enough, they're able to have a solid food. And in, in, in the faith, the first thing we need is, that's why I think all of us agree, when you're a new believer, and even before you become a believer, focus on the gospel. Uh, read the gospel of John five times, 10 times, 20 times. Um, and, and until you understand uh, this free gift and the guarantee of eternal life. And then once you have that down, uh, then you're ready for some more advanced spiritual topics. But until you have that really, uh, so that there can be no confusion, uh, then you're not ready. And that's what he's really talking about here. So before I go to the, the third translation and the footnotes here, uh, Renee, uh, you have any more? Thoughts on this? Yeah, I didn't go over two. I'm sorry. I thought we were doing just one. I messed up. Um, when it says, I have fed you with milk and not meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, 
neither yet now are you able. Uh, it's not an insult to these people. It's just making a statement of fact of where they are. And uh, the same thing was said to Nicodemus by Jesus. He said, if I tell you of, of earthly things and you don't believe or understand it, how are you going to understand heavenly things? And uh, so he is, is saying that they need to go back to the basic knowledge, the basic knowledge of Christ. And in this case, it's not necessarily salvation, but you need to be reminded of who saved you and what your identity is in the body. Uh, and that's milk before we can start the substance. So I, I think it's important to say he's not really insulting them. He's just making a statement of fact of where they are. Amen. All right, thanks. Uh, I'm sorry for the commotion. I, I had to take the opportunity to bring my fan into the room and get my fan going because, uh, as you know, I got menopause. Yeah, hot flashes. Uh, okay, Brother Cripps, uh, tell me a little bit more about that before I go to the uh, uh, the NABRE translation. Uh, you want me to go over it again? The the two verses. Well, after I after I commented and Renee commented and and also I had read the uh, Amplified. Do you have any more thoughts? Uh, no, I mean I think everyone's covered it for these for these two. I mean I agree with what everyone said, and um, <laughs> I I had already already commented on what Renee said, and um, I think you filled it in. Uh, not sure where to go with that. All right, then let me read uh, these first two verses in the in, in NABRE New American Bible Revised Edition. And I'm especially interested in their footnotes. Uh, and it says, brothers, and there's a footnote there. So let's look down what it says. Uh, the Corinthians desire a sort of wisdom dialogue of colloquially with Paul. Uh, they are looking for solid adult food and he appears to disappoint their expectations. Paul counters, if such a dialogue has not yet taken place, the reason is that they are still in immature stage of development. Um, three one uh, B it says spiritual people or, or versus fleshly people. Paul employs two clusters of concepts and terms to distinguish what later theology will call the natural and the supernatural. Uh, one, the, the natural person is 1 Corinthians 2.14, is one of whose existence, perceptions, and behaviors are determined by purely natural principles, the psyche. Um, and the sarx, or the flesh, it, it, it's a biblical term that connotes creature likeness. Uh, such persons are only infants. They remain on a purely human level. Uh, on the other hand, they are called to be animated by a higher principle, the pneuma. That's God's spirit. They are to become spiritual, pneuma, pneumatikoi, uh, and mature, and their perceptions and behavior. The culmination of existence in the spirit is described in 1 Corinthians 15, 44 through 49. So that's the... Um, that's the NABRE's uh, translation and footnotes on uh, on, on the, what we've covered so far here. Um, all right, I guess we'll go uh, continue on to the next verse in the, in the KJV. It says, uh, verse three, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal? and walk as men? Okay, uh, I'll stop there, Renee. Sorry, I keep forgetting that the little things are at the bottom now. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, it says, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you in being and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? So he's saying you're, uh, you are looking at outer things and getting into your flesh with arguing and dividing the body that is one. Yes. And uh, so he's saying the reason that you're not able to hear me is that you are still focusing on things out here mm. and not seeing it from things here. All right. 
Okay, uh, Brother Cripps, I'll read the next, verse 3 in the, in the Amplified before you comment here. Okay. It says, you are still worldly. That is, you are controlled by ordinary impulses, the, the sinful capacity. For as long as there is jealousy and strife and discord among you, you are not, you are not unspiritual uh, and are you not, oh, it says, are you not, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Are you not unspiritual and are you not walking like ordinary men with mm. unchanged, unchanged by the faith? Mm. That's fantastic. Um, I, it, it, so he's implying, what? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like Paul's implying that if those things are there, jealousy and strife and discord, then you're then you're definitely walking the flesh, and you're not you're not uh, walking in the new man. That's brilliant. I mean, so whenever we see these kinds of things going on, um, especially between two people, then it's one or both of the people that they're choosing to walk in the flesh instead of the spirit. The implication is that we don't walk in those sort of things. If we're walking in the spirit, we're not going to have jealousy and strife and discord. And that's huge for Paul to make a statement like that. How many people even believe that or, or integrate that into their life? Um, this is something that we've talked about before, and this it's something uh, that I personally um, react to, all the division and all the all the uh, frustration uh, between people uh, that call themselves brothers or sisters, um, all that stuff. It, and, and we know that it's fleshly. We know that they're, they're choosing to um, – uh, respond to something from the flesh instead of the spirit. So this is, to me, this is huge that um, if, if there's any of that going on, then we know immediately. This is a, a, a sign from Paul. It seems like it seems like he's pointing that out. Um, and it's a great point to make. I know I don't want to act in those ways. I don't want to be jealous toward my brothers or sisters or to have strife or discord. In fact, it, it uh, upsets me. It upsets me when things like that happen. Um, I, I would I would rather walk in love. I'd rather walk in the fruits that God's given us. I would rather have those be what are represented, um, especially in a relationship. So this is good stuff from Paul for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to relate this uh, so far to uh, to this congregation and uh, other groups of uh, uh, professing Christians that we encounter here online and do we do we have any uh jealousy envy strife discord well i'm pretty i'm pretty confident in 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 boasting that in this particular congregation we have either little to none discord and i think it's because uh um I, I when I first met Matthias and we talked about working together, um, we we both were familiar with the creed um, in essentials unity, in non essential liberty, in all things charity. I, I don't think it was a coincidence that I was uh, led to Matthias and, and that we we are we are on the same uh, um, path. And, and we, we both recognize the need to, to adopt this creed and apply it. And, uh, and that's the kind of the foundational principle of the congregation. We unite on the core doctrines of Christianity. And we, and we ask if you don't agree that Jesus is eternal God Almighty, if you don't agree that salvation is not earned by our own works, but because of the work Jesus did on our behalf on the cross and his promise of eternal life, that, that our faith in him and his finished work alone, if you don't believe that you cannot lose your salvation for any reason, uh, then uh, uh, then we do have a problem. We uh, we have to agree. We are dogmatic on these three essential doctrines. Uh, but we also agree that in all other theological questions that we have liberty, we have freedom, we don't have to agree. Uh, and, and, and when we disagree, we do it with charity or, that means, or love, respect, uh, in all of our conversations. And if you watch the Sunday program, you'll see that as we answer the questions, uh, there's a, a quite often disagreement. Uh, we answer the questions in a variety of ways. 
but we go out of our way to be respectful and courteous, even though we're disagreeing with each other. Yeah. And that's the reason that we don't have this jealousy, envy, discord, and strife in this congregation. But if you're familiar with some of the other groups on YouTube that, that uh, maybe you uh, interact with them sometimes, or if you, or if you want to compare, you'll see that they don't have this as an operating principle, unity, okay. liberty, and charity. And if you don't have that, then you find that uh, you can't have uh, peace and unity. You have to, you have discord. And I think all this is related to maturity. I think that uh, I'll boast. I think I have more spiritual maturity than, than uh, obviously a, a newborn person. I've been saved for 32 years. I've been growing and maturing for 32 years. Uh, I'm certainly a long ways from perfect, but I'll say that I've matured. And, and, um, Oh, so, and, and Matthias and Renee, and we, we have this experience. And because of that, we, we have the, the, the wisdom to um, uh, apply this principle and avoid this kind of um, uh, discord that Paul's talking about in Corinth. And it, I hope everybody will go back to the, the introduction on 1 Corinthians, uh, probably about four weeks ago. We did the introduction four or five weeks ago. And, and you'll get the foundation of what this book's all about. But Paul is living in Ephesus. He had already he established the Corinthian church about a year and a half earlier. And now he's living in Ephesus. And he gets a letter, we think, probably from uh, uh, Priscilla. Uh, and and, uh, uh, and uh, talking about, hey, there's all kinds of problems in the Corinthian church. And there's basically five issues that Paul is writing back to tell them, uh, to advise them or uh, uh, exhort them and correct them. And uh, part of the problem is this idea that uh, this all this strife and discord is going on in, in their congregation. And it's because they're not mature. They haven't grown and matured as, as you he had hoped after a year and a half. Um, okay, before I go into the, uh, the next translation, the footnotes, uh, Renee, uh, any more thoughts on this? No, I think we covered that pretty good. Uh, Cripps? I know, sir. Okay, let me just read that in the verse 3 in the NABRE. For you are still of the flesh, while there is jealousy and rivalry among you. Are you not of the flesh and behaving in an ordinary human way? Uh, uh, behaving in an ordinary human way. I, I've told the, this uh, story a few times before. So if you've heard it, I'm sorry for repeating myself, but I had a party at my house a few years back, and an old friend of mine going back to high school was there. And he was talking to a, a co-worker of mine, Bible Jim. He's a leader of the street preachers in, of America. And Rick was amazed because of the street preaching and the, th the things he saw in my life that I was doing. And he's, he's, I can't believe this. I can't believe he's doing these things. He, you know, because I've known him since high school. And Bible Jim kept on saying to Rick, "It's not natural, is it? It doesn't. It doesn't seem natural." <laughs> <laughs> that's the point. And Jim was trying to make him understand this is a supernatural thing that's happened here. Yeah. Luke hasn't made worked real hard to try to change itself. It's it's God that's worked in him to change his desires and interests. And that's what uh, I think this is referring to here. Okay. Um, I'll go to the next verse in the uh, KJV. Uh, verse four is for while on for while one saith, I am of Paul. And another, I am of Apollos. Are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Sister Renee? Yeah. Um, I'm going to break this down a little bit. Um, He's saying that they are they are uh, dividing themselves based on who taught them or who got them saved or who you know gave them the gospel. Um, and it says, are, can we are we just doing that one verse here? I read three four, verses. Four, Renee. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Four, five, um, and six, Renee. Okay, good. Because I, I didn't want to go ahead and say something wrong. Yep. Um, we had a little try. Uh, 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 something we needed to deal with in the chat. 
uh, who then is Paul and who's Apollos, but ministers by whom you believe. See, uh, these people, Apollos, Paul, everyone they're mentioning, they are just ministers or servants by whom they were able to believe. So these were people that brought them the message of salvation, but they themselves didn't save him. So they shouldn't be dividing into, hey, I'm from, I'm of this guy. I'm of that guy. No, because you're all of Christ. So you can't break it down into, because we're nothing. We're, we're just giving you the message from the one who did save you. Uh, and he's saying, I have planted. So he, he, he got, he, he uh, preached the gospel. Apollos watered, meaning he's the one that helped them grow. He's kind of discipling them and, uh, or, or baptized them. I'm not sure. Uh, but God gave the increase. So God is the one that gave you salvation. And that should be your focus. And that God should bring you into unity, not the men who did little bits of the work to get you to God. And you don't divide up the body of Christ. Yeah. It's all Christ. So they were just uh, in the flesh, as it says earlier, focusing on who had actually either baptized them or preached the gospel or who's discipling them instead of Christ who saved them. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. Brother Cripps, those three verses, please. Yes, sir. So the, the key word Renee used there was focus. Where's the focus? So these people that Paul's talking to, their focus is, and he's pointing it out to them, the focus is on the people that brought you in rather than where the focus should be, which is God. And at the end of verse uh, six is the, is the real point of this whole thing to me. God gave the increase. God gave the increase. Um, I've said on other shows before, the focus needs to be on Christ. If we're focused on him, all this other stuff uh, goes to the wayside. We're not focused on the world. We're not focused on other people and and uh, being concerned about their opinions. We're focused on what what uh, what Christ has done. Um, and it's the way that we come into salvation perfectly. And I love that Paul's saying that here. It's not the 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 pastor. You know, I'm not of Billy Graham. I'm not of Creflo Dollar. I'm not of. I mean, I'm I, I'm not of any of those people. Um, I'm not focused on who it was that, that brought me to God. Uh, I'm focused on Christ. That's, that's where my trust is. That's where my faith is. Um, that's the only thing that saves me. Um, so uh, Paul's pointing this out in the context of being carnal and walking like men uh, by first talking about the, the uh, strife and, and envying and all that. And then now he's saying, also, you guys are talking about that you're being in different sex because of who brought you in, and you shouldn't be doing that because you're you're focused on the wrong things. Uh, focus on God; He gives the increase, and all this other stuff uh, is secondary. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, when I first read that. I'm thinking, I thought we. Am I in the right place? Because I remember we did, we talked about this before. Now, then I remember, wait, well, it was in the first chapter. In the first chapter, Paul made this point that uh, uh, it, it, it's not about you being with of Cephas, which, which is right. Peter's name, or, or Apollos or Paul. It's about Christ. And uh, we so we, we did a quite a, a good um, talk on that in the first chapter. And now he's referring to the same point again, but he's just he's just saying Apollos or Paul. And uh, uh, but let me in the in the Amplified, this is the way it says it. for for when one of you says, I am a disciple of Paul and another, I am a disciple of Apollos. Are you not proving yourselves unchanged, just ordinary people? Mm. What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Just servants through whom you believed in Christ, even as the Lord appointed to each his task. I planted, Apollos watered, but God all the while was causing the growth. Mm. Um, in terms of the growth, um, uh, I'm not sure if I'm right in saying this. Uh, if the growth is the springing to life, uh, I've always thought that this was referring to, okay, someone tells people the gospel and uh, maybe uh, they're, they're not ready to uh, believe and they're not convinced. And then someone comes and waters what someone else had already started. Uh, 
and they're watering it and they, another person waters and another person waters and maybe many years, maybe decades later, finally, uh, it springs to life. Now they understand and believe, and, and but God is the one that causes your spirit to come to life, to be born again uh, because of your belief. Um, now, that's why I've always understood it. But since we're talking tonight about spiritual growth and maturity and, and the way it's re written here in the Amplified, uh, it could have a double meaning or it could be just talking about growing. But that's what the way it's shown in the Amplified. It says, but God all the while was causing the growth. So I've always thought that it was God that caused it to spring to life. Uh, but here it's saying God's causing the growth, which means growing from a baby into a mature believer. So uh, I'm not sure if I'm correct in, in that or not. But any more on that before we go to the NABRE? Sure. I think I think the point you're making is is uh, accurate. Um, it's but either way, it's God that's doing it. It's not other people. It's not ourselves. We're not doing it. It's God causing it. I think that's the main point. Um, Matthias said in the chat that uh, harvest is the point of regeneration. So that that comes uh, at, at the point of belief that the, the, the quickening happens then, but we're talking about how a person changes from being a babe or an infant uh, and, and uh, uh, drinking milk to maturing and, and being able to eat meat. And to me, that's just a, um, a byproduct of uh, being in his word and fellowship and trusting uh, more and more in him and learning and, and growing and changing. Either way, the growth is caused by God. God's the one that brings that. The other, uh, in, in the King James, it said, uh, brings the increase. Increase in growth, it's similar, similar um, things. Um, when you think about it, like plants, plant growth or tree growth or whatever, um, you water it, you, I mean, you plant it, you water it and you watch, watch it grow. Um, so at what point was, was the growth put into that seed? It was already there. Um, but, uh, it, there's, there's still a process that's involved. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Let's go back to the, uh, the KJV and the next verse, um, verse eight. Uh, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 9. Did I miss verse 7? Let me see. Okay, let me go back to verse 7. I'm sorry. Um, so, so then neither is he that planteth any, anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now, he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Mm. Let's, ask, let's ask Brother Cripps to go first on this one. Thank seven, you. Seven, eight, and nine. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah, so he's, he's uh, in Paul fashion, he's pounding this point home so that everybody can understand it. So they could understand it back then and we can understand it now. Um, so then neither uh, he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Again, pounding home the point that he made in verse six, God gave the increase. He's, he's saying it's not, it's not me that's doing it. It's not Peter that's doing it, nor any of the other disciples or any of the televangelists out there now. Um, it's not any of us. It's God that, that does that. Now, in verse 8, he's saying, um, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. So we're working in concert. Uh, you know, I, like Matthias might uh, talk to someone and, and plant a few things, or Renee might plant a few things, and then I come along and someone come, you know, comes around me and uh, likes my particular approach, and then they might ask me some questions. This has happened. And, and I, I uh, breathe into them and I uh, uh, talk to them and there, there's some watering going on. And then, uh, but in the end, we work together. All of us work together on anyone that we encounter, all with the same goal, to point to Christ. That's it. It's to point to Christ. Whatever a person is dealing with, it can all be solved 
by getting them to focus on him. I believe that 100%. So then verse nine, for we are laborers together with God. So now, now he's saying, Paul's saying that we work together in concert uh, with God. We're his husbandry. Uh, you are God's building. So this is, this is us working together uh, and, and trying to bring people into that uh, deeper relationship and in, into growth. But God's the one that does it. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Uh, Brene, I'm going to read the Amplified before you respond uh, okay. to, to, to these verses here. Uh, it's um, 7, 8, 9. So neither is the one who plants nor the one who waters anything, but only God who causes the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, uh, that is, in, in importance and esteem, working toward the same purpose. But each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, his servants working together. You are God's cultivated field, his garden, his mm. vineyard, God's building. Mm. I like that. His garden, his vineyard. That's nice. I was actually going to use uh, the word husbandry is really the cultivation of plants or even animals. When you raise animals and mate them and make them increase, yeah. it's called husbandry. Mm -hmm. It's about the multiplying and growth, building and building and building. Mm. So I, I'm glad they put that there. That's interesting. Mm. Um, this this here where it says, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. So they're saying, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Paul. Well, Paul plants and Apollos waters. Guess what? You can't divide them because they're one. You can't say I'm from him and I'm from him because they're both one. Because it's not about either one of them. It's about God. Yeah. Because if you'll notice in the next verse, it's God, God. God, he mentions God three times in one sentence. Mm -hmm. And then he says, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now, some believe in eternal reward system. I do. I think it's scriptural, and we're going to address this very thing in this chapter. And when it says reward, it could also be uh, the souls you get to see saved. That's a reward in itself, yeah. knowing that you're serving the Lord with uh, productivity. And it says, for we are laborers together with God. So we're just helpers, right? And ye are God's husbandry. Ye are the uh, cultivated crops, the cultivated uh, animal husbandry. You're just building and building and multiplying. Mm. Ye are God's building. Yeah. So uh, uh, again, he's confirming that, you know, you can't divide into this guy and this guy because they're one, as we all should be in Christ. And God should be the focus. It's in God three times in the next verse. Amen. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the um, this jealousies and envies and strife and discord issue, it's one of the issues that uh, Paul's trying to straighten out in this church he established. And as I said, um, everything that happened in the first century church uh, is still happening today. Uh, there's, I think, Solomon, I think, said there's nothing new under the sun in Ecclesiastes. Yeah. And um, the, the problems that we're dealing with, all the false teachings and false doctrines and issues uh, and conflicts uh, uh, that we deal with all the time and accusations that were made against Paul and they're being made against us today. Uh, so um, this, is, this is not new. Uh, when you identifying with a man this should put an end to the idea, anybody even thinking that they should identify as a Lutheran or identify as a Calvinist. That's what I've always thought. When I first read these verses, I'm thinking, Paul's clearly saying, don't lift up him or Peter or anything and, and, and identify in that way as, well, I'm with them. They're, they're theology. They're, they're the ones that I'm listening to and following. And you're, you're, you lost sight of, of who it is, it is your savior God, it's Jesus, it's about Jesus, and uh, not about any of us. So um, these, these are not new problems, we're still wrestling with these problems in our communities now, factions dividing over, you know, various leaders in these different communities and and uh, charges and accusations back and forth, it's, it's, it's sad that 
2,000 years and <laughs> we still have all the same problems. Oh, completely agree. Um, okay, so uh, let's go to um, the verse 10 in the KJV. Um, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth there, thereupon. Mm. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Yes. Renee, 10 and 11, Renee. Now I love this whole section. I've done quite a quite a few videos on this section that we're getting on getting to. Uh, so he's reminding them again. We all it's all God, and anybody that's working is one. So there's no dividing. But he also is uh, showing how each one contributes to the work of God as each has their own gift and so forth and their own reward. So according to the grace of God, which is given unto me, so his purpose as a wise master builder, so he's saying that God has given him this perfect purpose of starting the foundation of a building here. I have laid the foundation and another build it thereon, but let every man take heed how he build it thereon. So he's saying, I'm coming here and I'm starting the churches. I am giving you the saving message as, as, uh, told by Jesus himself, but I'm going to, I have assigned people to help you grow up in the faith. So they will be building their upon what he started. And, uh, that and then he warns, make sure you be careful how you build upon the foundation that I I've laid. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Brother Cripps, verse yes. nine, uh, 10 and 11. Yes, sir. So I'll give you an example. So let's say someone goes and watches one of Renee's videos and then they they come on uh, uh, my channel and do a testimony and I'm, I'm talking to them. And um, I know that they came through uh, Renee. They even mentioned, yeah, you know, I, I found Renee on, on YouTube and she really helped me understand a lot of things better. Um, if I go contrary and I try to teach this person something contrary to what Renee is taught, it, we're not going to be in concert with each other. And this is why it's so important to be of one mind, especially on the essentials. We all have to have the same essentials. And that way, uh, we don't have to worry about uh, someone going to someone else in the group and then being taught something different. Um, I think that's extremely important. So uh, what he's talking about, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Um, and then again, here's the, I love that Paul does this. How many times you heard me say this about, um, Paul pounding the, the, the same topic home and verse 11 does it for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Again, the focus is all on him, all this other stuff that's out there, even, even all, all the different doctrines and all the different arguments. Um, if everyone's not of one mind, this one thing can be sure. The foundation is Jesus Christ. That's where the focus needs to be. He is the uh, perfecter of our faith, and everything is done through him. He's already done the work. So if we're keeping our eyes focused on him, this is the point that Paul's making to me, um, that he's the foundation. He's the cornerstone. Everything revolves around him our entire uh, salvation and faith and grace and everything that we deal with is based on him. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Amen. What, what stands out to me as I read this in the amplified here, uh, 10 and 11 says, according to the remarkable grace of God, which was given to me to prepare me for my task, like a skillful master builder, I laid a foundation. And now another is building on it, but each one must be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. So uh, to me, the thing that stands out to me uh, in verse 11 in the Amplified is this word already. Um, no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is already laid. Paul laid the foundation, and that foundation is 
the person of Jesus Christ, yes. the, 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 the accomplishments of Jesus Christ for us, and the promise of Jesus Christ to us. This is the foundation. Yes. Now, it, building upon it, okay, yeah, they can teach you all the, 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 the things that we want to learn as we grow and mature, but don't let them replace the foundation with, as it says here, another a lay of... Uh, lay a foundation other than the one which is already laid. It's okay to build on the foundation, but don't let them tear up the foundation that Paul laid and that we are laying, all of us preaching Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian. It's about Christ. It's not about me. How do they How do they want to tear up the foundation and build another foundation for you? Uh, it pretty much boils down to it's not about Jesus. It's about you. Yeah. Amen, Brother Luke. They, they, they want to turn it around and take the focus off of Jesus and his accomplishments, his finished work, his promise of eternal life, and instead make the focus about you and make it the focus. The foundation now becomes you got to repent of your sins. Yep. You better be sorry. You better have tears for those sins, and you better have regret, and then you better get change your life and not sin anymore. It's all about you now. That's the, that's replacing the foundation uh, that that Paul laid, and that yes. we're all laying in, in our uh, uh, everybody here in the church of eternally secure. That's teaching. We're all laying the same foundation as Paul, and and then of course in these Bible studies we expound on all the scriptures and we're building, uh, but we're not tearing up the foundation and putting in another one. No. Amen. Uh, okay, and there I think I got a footnote in here. Uh, on the uh, NABRE for verse uh, 10. Let me look and see. It says, um, uh, there are diverse functions in the service of the community, but each individual's task is serious and each will stand accountable for the quality of his contribution. Yeah, so that would pertain to Renee's comments, especially about rewards. Um, I was surprised a brother that we love, all know and love, told me recently that he uh, doesn't believe in the rewards system. And I said, well, okay, we'll have to talk about that. I haven't been able to follow up and discuss it further with him, but uh, it always surprises me when someone comes up with that. Uh, but does it really matter to me? I know I, I, this is not one of the three core doctrines. Right. Um, I had a Bible gym ask me once in street preaching. He said, Luke, why are you here? Are you, are, are you here uh, um, for the lost or are you here uh, for rewards uh, or, or what's, what's your reason for being here? Or, or are you here to just serve God? And, and I said, well, I, I'd say all three. I do care about the lost. That's why I'm here. I, I, I want them to hear the good news. I want them to get this gift. I want to share the good news about the free gift. And so I, I'm doing it for them. Uh, and I'm doing it because I love God and want to proclaim His name. And 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 uh, but for rewards, it's not my primary motivation. But I'm happy that we do get rewards. Jesus said, "Don't build up your treasures on earth, where moth and rust can destroy. They're, they're just temporary things, in other words. But build up your treasures in heaven, where moth and rust cannot destroy. So these eternal treasures, treasures that we're getting from our ministerial works here as Christians, and Whatever these rewards are, my wife asked me what they are the other day, and I, I said, well, it's gold, silver, precious gems, and, and uh, crowns, and she doesn't know what that means. I said, I don't know what it means. And it also says that we're going to, uh, based on how, uh, the works, the, the, how faithful we were in working for Jesus after we got saved, that we will be in charge over one city or 10 cities or so on. So there is a merit system. There is a reward system for believers, but uh, eternal life, is a free gift. The rewards are earned through our, our religious work. So people say that we're against works. No, look how hard we're working. You know, yeah. we're all we're all on here almost every day talking yeah. about Jesus and producing these programs and answering people's questions and, and having private conversations behind the scenes. We're working. And uh, we're working, as I said, for all I'm doing it for all three reasons. Because I care about the lost, and I care about the believer too, who struggles with something and needs an answer, and and, and I also love God and just want to keep talking about God all the time. Yeah, but it's not just God generally, our great Savior, God Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, uh, all right. Uh, any more on that, Renee or? Yeah, I did. I didn't get. I, I okay. Let me say. Hold on. 
uh, Levi Khan ironically said, for somebody that believes you better not be working for salvation, you sure work hard. Why are you working if you don't? I'm like, do you not get the concept of we are saved and that's why we work? He doesn't. He doesn't. People can't get the concept that we actually serve God and live the best we can to keep keep his ways uh, and follow the spirit because he saved us. Sure. Our love for him. Yeah. He loves people and he loved us. And because we love him, we want to tell others that he loves them. Yep. So you can follow that. You know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right. I'd never heard it that way, Brother Luke, where you're saying that's the quality of the reward you get. I thought uh, my concept, I, it's interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way when it says uh, uh, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Uh, I thought that was the quality of our works and that with fire, the, the works that are made of wood, hay, stubble are burned away. And the only the gold, silver, precious stones remain after the scrutiny of the fire judgment. I don't know. I'd never thought of it that way, but you could be right. You know, I think about the breastplate of of the the Levitical priesthood and the breastplate that Lucifer or Hillel used to wear in heaven. You know, it's possible. I hadn't thought of it that way before. I like it when I hear something I hadn't heard before. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Brother Cripps, any more on that before we move on? Yeah, this is fascinating. And I, I look, I, I um, am not focused on the rewards. I'm just going to be happy to be there, honestly. Uh, uh, and um, just kind of the way I was brought up, and I was brought up just, you know, not to uh, focus on the reward of things, um, but, you know, just, just diligently work, just uh, be the best person I can be. Um, will I be uh, thankful for any rewards I get? Absolutely. But I'm just happy to, to see my Savior and be face-to-face -face with him. But he tells us, that, as uh, Brother Luke was pointing out, he tells us, store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Store up. So he's telling us he's, that we can do that. We can store up treasures in heaven for ourselves. And um, I, I just want to touch on what Renee said. Absolutely, there are so many people that don't understand. It's like when it comes to service, they're so focused on the works. When it comes to service, they don't understand why we're doing what we do. If we if, if we believe in grace, then why are we working at all? Why aren't we just sitting on our butts and and uh, uh, planning on going robbing a bank? Because we can do that anyway. It, again, it's because their focus is in the wrong place. We do it for reasonable service. Renee, you did a good job of put, uh, putting that uh, the way that you did. Reasonable service is the reason we do it. He's done all this for us. So that's why we do it. And yes, God is so merciful in giving that he gives us rewards to that. The truth is we should be doing that anyway and get no reward. We should. We should just do it because he did it for us. Look at all that he did for us. We don't deserve any of it. But we have a, a giving, loving, merciful God that says you'll be rewarded for the work that you do. Because he's fair and just, and that's what he decided to do. He looks at us as if we are his own son. We're adopted sons to God. And he's saying, at the end, you're going to get rewards for what you do. That's fantastic. It just shows how loving and merciful he is. Well, I think that there are a lot of people who actually uh, do get busy working um, after they get saved, and they are actually unaware of this reward system. Yeah. So they, they, they haven't got that far in their studies to even understand that, hey, uh, you're, if you get busy working in some kind of ministry service for Christ, that uh, God's going to reward you. Uh, they're not even aware that, that God has this, this system in place. Uh, and, and, and yet they want to work for the Lord anyway. Yeah. So I, I, I think also that the motivation of our work uh, is, is part of uh, this judgment, at the, whether it's burned up. Because sometimes we might think that what we're doing is, is, uh, has some value, and God will value it and reward us. Yeah. And we might find that it gets burned up because maybe it's not really what God wanted you to do, yeah. or maybe your uh, motivation for doing it was not pure and for that reason, uh, God says, no, I, he did it for the wrong reasons. Yes. That's so, uh, that's, I'm just theorizing there. I don't know for sure. 
No, I, I agree with you, Brother Luke. That's the wood, hay, and stubble, I believe. I believe if your intent is doing it on a reasonable service for God, then anything like that is precious stones. Anything that, that we do just because of what he did for us, we're doing it for the right reasons. We're not doing it just for our own our own gain. Our, our um, motives are in the right place. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, we kind of jumped ahead a little bit, but let me read now, uh, starting with uh, verse 12 in the KJV. Now, if any man, man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, and because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Boom. Yeah. Um, okay, Sister Renee, verse uh, 12 and 13. 12 and 13, please. Okay. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, so the foundation is what? Jesus Christ. Yes. No other foundation can be laid. There's your salvation. Yep. Unfortunately, people's foundation is uh, foundation Jesus plus uh, filthy rags because it's not gold, silver, precious stones unless you're in Christ. Mm -hmm. Because you can't do anything good. He who does righteous is righteous. So you have to be righteous. You have to be in Christ and have his righteousness in order to even perform anything of righteousness. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so the, the building on gold, silver, precious stone would a stubble. That's your works that God had said predestined us to walk in. So uh, uh, the foundation must be Christ alone. And then our works build upon that. And those works are what we're rewarded for. And it says every man's work. I, I'm, a lot of people, not a lot. But a few are adamantly opposed to any reward in scripture when it's so clear, build your treasures in heaven. But these verses are ridiculously clear and they are not metaphoric. No. Uh, they are talking about the day of judgment and they are literal reward of some sort. We know the 12 apostles have the 12 tribes of Israel they rule over. Yeah. And Jesus talks about, you know, whatever he gives you, uh, if you don't, if you don't invest in that, he's going to take away even what you have. But what little you have, if you sow that, he's going to increase you and give you even more. And that's here on this earth, I believe, our spiritual gifts. And if you use them, he'll give you more. And if you, uh, and also in in the eternal realm, I, I believe it has something to do with because it says if one will rule two cities, one will rule five cities, one yeah. will rule ten, and we rule and reign with Christ. So um, when it says. Um, Every man's work shall be made manifest. So God's going to scrutinize them for the day shall declare it. And the day, uh, I believe, is the day of judgment. Um, declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And it says that God's an all-consuming fire. So this is just my understanding. It could mean something else. That God is an all-consuming fire and he will judge or scrutinize the work. It's the scrutiny of God, yes. this fire. And the fire shall try every man's work what sort it is so it's god that determines the quality of the work and rewards accordingly i think mm. Mm. all right uh, i'm going to read it in the amplified uh before i talk about it um let me see what verse did we start with it uh what verse did we start on if any minutes yeah uh, verse 12, right? Yeah, 12 and 13. Verse, verse 12, okay. But if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will be clearly shown for what it is. For the mm -hmm. day of judgment will disclose it because it is to be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality and character and worth of each person's work. Yep. Uh, I believe the Amplified is amplifying it the way I did uh, mm -hmm. about uh, this. Uh, sometimes the work, uh, even though, uh, even though maybe we had good intentions, uh, the work was not valued. It's not what God wanted you to do. 
And maybe sometimes it's what God wanted you to do, but your character and reasons and motivation behind it that were, were not pure. And so that's amplified is basically agreeing with me that our character uh, as we're doing this and the quality of our work is, is, is a factor. But let, I want to talk about uh, this. Um, it, uh, did we read 14? Uh, no. No, 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 13. The fire. Okay, it's going to be um, revealed with fire. Uh, I want to go over the footnote of uh, 14 here. It's uh, 13 and uh, and 15. There's a footnote. It says, the day, which the, the great day of Yahweh, the judgment, the day of judgment, which can be a time of either gloom or joy, uh, fire both destroys and purifies. That's verse 13, their footnote. Uh, I would say that uh, I don't like the way they're talking about that. This is, uh, um, I, I'm not sure that we're going to have a, um, a gloom uh, at the judgment seat of Christ, even though some of our works is burned up, uh, like wood, hay, and stubble, God's going to say that that has no value to me. Yeah. Uh, or you, it was good work, but you, you had the wrong uh, motivation behind it. So you, no reward for that. It's burned up. I don't think we're going to be crying and, and no. all gloomy over it. Uh, I'm, I'm just my theory because there's not supposed to be any tears in heaven for, for, uh, for us at least. And, uh, but, um, but it says the fire both destroys and purifies. Uh, I don't think this fire here is to purify anything. Um, and I don't think the fire in hell is purifies either. Burn or in, there, uh, you think, Luke? Somebody yeah, tried to put their down. Yeah, yeah. The, this is a purgatory verse for Roman Catholicism. But ver, verse 15, the footnote here is, will be saved. Uh, that means although Paul can envision very harsh divine punishment, uh, see 1 Corinthians 3.17, uh, he appears optimistic about the success of divine corrective means, both here and elsewhere, um, uh, regarding discipline. The text of 1 Corinthians 3.15 has sometimes been used to support the notion of purgatory, though it does not envisage this. So this idea of, um, let me see. Um, if any man's work abide, he shall ha hath build there, but he shall receive reward. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. The Roman Catholic, and uh, even some others who hold to the the fire. See, uh, I believe when we talk about the fire, uh, uh, the lake of fire, the, that, that fire can either consume or it can torment or it can purge. These are the three possible uh, beliefs of, uh, regarding that fire. My conclusion is it's the, the fire that consumes. When people go into that lake of fire, they're consumed and they perish. Uh, others believe that they go into that fire and they are tormented in the fire forever and ever. And then the Roman Catholic believes they go in that fire and their sins are purged. Uh, they burn for a while and eventually their sins are paid for by burning, suffering in the fire. And then they, they get to go to heaven. So the Roman Catholic belief system is this particular verse supports their concept of purgatory. But I don't think so. Uh, I think it, when it says but he himself shall be saved. Uh, it, it means that uh, your, your salvation is not at risk, even though there is fire here in this judgment seat of Christ, but the fire is not there for punishment. It's there to show you that some of your work was, was useless and not valued by God. This, to, to conclude that this fire is, is talking about um, purging you from your sins, is, uh, this is not talking about sins anywhere. This is talking about a reward system. Uh, okay, uh, Renee, any more on that? Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, you're if it, it, he's all consuming, so consuming can purge, as in like when you uh, like reprobate silver, that is uh, uncleansed and unpurified. So through God's fire, the quality of the work, as you said, uh, would be purged from any impurities. Yep. Anything not of God. And it's clear to me that's a real twist of scripture and putting in ideas into the scripture that's not there. Um, it's clearly about trying the works by fire. 
Yeah. Uh, and any works that are not of God will be consumed or purged. And then only what's left will be purified gold, silver, and precious stones. I just, I want to just put a picture there for that. Problem. That was good. That was good, Renee. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Brother Cripps, any more on that before we move on? Yeah, I just I, I love uh, love this uh, particular uh, discourse because it, it it just puts it out there so we can understand kind of what happens and, and Renee just uh, really laid that down well. Um, that that's exactly what happens when they burn the impurities out of a uh, of precious metal. They get it really really hot and um, all the slag burns off, and then all that's left is the 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 precious material that's used. This is uh, 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 a purification process so it's certainly not a, a, a verse about purgatory mm -hmm. it's simply saying that it burns off the things that are that are not useful to god yeah and uh, when you do uh purify uh ore and you're left with pure silver or gold then um it, it is a purification system and it's based upon uh what is not valuable is discarded and you're left with what's valuable correct and, and so it would be what god values does god value what you did okay that you pass that test does god value your motive behind it your character that, uh, that you that you that caused you to do it uh uh and okay you pass that test so um but if there's any uh, bad motivations or doing works that god didn't want want you to do that uh, are not led by the spirit but by your own flesh i would say that, that would be burned off because those are not pure and god does not value it so yeah. you're left with what god values um all right uh, let's go back to the kjv verse um 16. know ye not that ye are the temple of god and that the spirit of god dwelleth in you I don't know if I should go further or not. What do you think, Renee? Want me to go further or just that verse? Uh, no, let's let's do it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, this, all right. This is clearly confirming the truth that we are indwelled by God Himself. It also confirms that if you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, a promise that there's a promise, a sure hope, and that you are sealed until the day of redemption. And because of that, you are a temple. It's not like the temple in Jerusalem where the Spirit could come and go at will. He stays in this temple. He remains because once you're in Christ, you are always in Christ. You are mm born of God and God does not do abortions. Mm. Uh, and it says, and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. These are statements of fact. There's no if and buts about it. He is yours and you are his. And that's a done deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Okay, Brother Cripps, uh, I'm going to read that uh, verse 16 in the Amplified for you. It says, do you not know and understand that you, that is the church, are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells permanently in you? That is collectively and individually. I like it, collectively and individually. That's great. Do you not know and understand that you, the church, that's us, are the temple of God? Uh, each individual, one of us, has the spirit of God, and Renee pointed that out. Um, she also said, even before reading the Amplified, that uh, God dwells permanently. And isn't, that, isn't that a great promise? It's permanently. It doesn't. He doesn't come and go. It's like, oh, you, you, you know, you committed a sin, so I'm going to go back out until you get right with me, and then I'm going to come back in, or, or you know, you, you, you do some horrible thing, or say something horrible about a brother or sister, and then. The Holy Spirit says, "Oh, I, I can't handle that. I've got to I've got to go out of you and then come back in." No, it's permanently. We don't lose the Spirit of God. He stays with us. Um, and yes, if we live a sinful life, He will punish us. He will chastise us. He will He will uh, do all kinds of stuff to bring us into uh, His will. 
Um, but he's in us once we're uh, sealed with, by the Holy Spirit. I think um, uh, uh, Victoria mentioned that in the chat. We're sealed. Uh, and that seal doesn't come off of us. And I, I think that's a great promise. We don't ever have to uh, vacillate in uh, back and forth between whether the spirits were his spirits in us or not. And plus, um, we have the confirmation of this very spirit that's in us, that he's in us and that we're his. He's constant. That spirit's constant. Tell us, you're, you're my son. You're my daughter. Over and over and over again. Um, I love you. I care about you. These are positive messages that that we all uh, receive, especially when we're being attacked from the outside. If we remember that, we remember that his spirit never leaves us. That's something that we can cling to. We can keep our eyes focused on Christ. It, it's so important. Um, that's what I try to do, at least. And it's very helpful to, to keep that in mind. Okay. All right, let's go to the KJV, verse 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. Let me stop there. Um, Brother Cripps, 17 18. Yeah, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Um, I, how would someone defile the temple of God if the Holy Spirit is already in it? Uh, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Were his temple. How, so I'm, I'm a little bit confused by this. How would someone defile uh, themselves? I'll read it in the Amplified. Just maybe okay. it'll help you. It says, if anyone destroys the temple of God, that is corrupting it with false doctrine, mm -hmm. God will destroy the destroyer. For the temple of God is holy or sacred, and that is what you are. Let no one deceive himself. If any anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool, discarding this, his worldly pretensions and acknowledging his lack of wisdom so that he may become truly wise. Okay, so it says God will destroy the destroyer, the person that's, that's, uh, that's coming against uh, his temple, the temple which he resides in. That's what, that's what it's amplifying. Let no one deceive himself. Anyone among you thinks that he is wise in, in, his, in this age. Let him become a fool, discarding the worldly pretensions, acknowledging his lack of wisdom. Yeah, um, that, that's what I, I believe if the Holy Spirit is in us, that's the point that we will come to. Even if we uh, hear a wrong doctrine and we um, believe something that's not true uh, for a while, uh, if we truly are saved and sealed, then he's going to bring us to that point and bring us to the point of realizing that we were acting like a fool and bring us back into his wisdom. And um, that's the way I see it, at least. All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Renee? Yeah, I want to say something here. This is something that is not understood correctly. A lot of lordshippers bring this verse at me as if they're saying, see, you're the temple of God. And if you defile it, like by drinking and smoking, God's going to destroy you. And that's nowhere. Even if it was about that, and that's not the context, obviously, it's about defiling us with false messages, as you can see in the, right. in the context. Then uh, the uh, even if it was that, it would just be temporal destruction, right. earthly destruction at the worst. So, but that's not what it's about at all, as you correctly pointed out, brother. Um, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Now, you yourself are not giving yourself false doctrine. It's the person that's preaching it to you, and it goes along with Paul saying, whoever troubled you guys, he shall bear his judgment, whoever he shall be. There it is. Yes. So, it's another way of saying that. So, if any man, if somebody comes and preaches to us, something false about Jesus or another way to salvation or confuses us, 
in our growth process so that we're not able to perform the good works and joy and peace as we should. Yeah. And God is going to destroy that person because yeah. uh, he's defiled the temple. He has put leaven in the whole and the whole lumps messed up now. There we go. The temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So this is not a warning to you as right. in if you don't live right, God's going to, you're going to hell. And that's what most people falsely use. Again, scripture is the term of heart. And if you don't have your grace gospel uh, go goggles on, uh, you're you're going to see condemnation and everything. Yeah. Because uh, to the pure, all things are pure. To the divine, unbelieving, it's nothing. It's conscious is defiled. If, uh, it's as if any man, uh, the author of the story, which temple are ye? Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that it may be wise. So this is a warning saying, if you think you know something, yeah. you're trying to preach something, but it's wrong. Uh, don't try to figure it out in the world. You need to, you need to become lower yourself and let God instruct you. Because you will be wise. And it's a uh, warning of not preaching Paul, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, this verse, these verses here are have a, a lot of potential problems if, if they're taken out of context. Uh, you know, there's a saying, a, a verse taken out of context is a pretext. Now, pretext uh, really means that it, you're intentionally using something to, to uh, uh, deceive someone. You have a pretext, you have a premeditated motivation to deceive someone. That's your pretext. And... Um, so this verse is one of those that could be used to, as Sister Renee says, she has to answer this, explain this verse to people often. Yeah. But I, I think that the way the Amplified says it and the way that Renee answered it is exactly the way you see it because I, Paul has been talking about this foundation of Jesus Christ and don't, don't try to tear up that foundation and uh, uh, put a different foundation in his place. And then he goes on to say that you're, that if, it says, it says, if uh, any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Yeah. He's talking about the one who's defiling it. It's not, it's not the person. But for example, let's say you're a babe in Christ. And that's who Paul, uh, Paul's talking to at this church here. He's calling them babes. And, and the Judaizers follow Paul around to all his churches. And when Paul leaves, they go in there and they say paul's a false apostle he's he's telling you that all you got to do is believe in jesus and you got to turn to life that's not true you've got to get circumcised you got to keep the sabbath you got to follow the laws of moses you got to go to the temple make the sacrifices you got to become a jew it's practicing judaism and believing in jesus faith and your works and so that's these people this was the the thorn in the flesh of Paul. These people who were being a pain in the butt to Paul, uh, the Judaizers falling around trying to ruin his, and they were very successful. Look what they did in, in this Corinthian church. Between the Judaizers coming in and the pagan uh, religions that were already there uh, polluting it, Paul's teaching, um, that's what happened. So these imagine you're a babe in Christ, and now people come in and start telling you that Paul's a false apostle, and you gotta do this and this and this. And uh, and that is that's someone who is defiling what Paul laid the foundation that Paul laid, and those people who, that are defiling it, God will destroy them. It's yeah. not talking about the person that's being affected by it, the babe, and that's why I like the way it's expressed in the uh, Amplified when it says, uh, "Do you not know and understand that you, the church, are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells permanently?" in you collectively and individually if anyone destroys the temple of god that is corrupting it with false doctrine god will destroy the destroyer yep uh so i think they got it right and i'm glad renee understand this and she's been helping people with this these problem verses um i'd like to also talk about this idea of collectively and individually uh that uh that every believer has the holy spirit in them uh, and then as a collectively, we're the church, uh, which is a collection of all the believers. Uh, the, collect, collect, the, the, the totality of all believers is the church or the body of Christ. I, I remember many years ago, uh, I first heard the, the idea that the church is not an organization. Um, and and uh, 
Um, I'm glad that some people understand that we're, we're not supposed to have a hierarchy in the church like they did in Romanism. Right. And that's what I think that uh, was being taught in, in Revelation against the Nicolaitans. Mm -hmm. These people were trying to establish a difference between the laity and the clergy and, and put the laity under the feet of the clergy and get a higher governmental system that they were establishing. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have with Roman Catholicism. And, and, and but so is the church an organization like that or is the church an organism? Mm. Uh, I think we need to understand it's an organism. Mm. An organism is a, uh, a living thing that is made up of many cell living cells. Mm -hmm. so each believer would be a cell that's part of this organism mm -hmm. rather than being an organization where we, the laity, are under the thumbs or under the heels, under the boots of the clergy. Mm -hmm. I like that. An organism that should be of one mind, according to Paul. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Can we go on to uh, uh, verse? Uh, oh, we didn't really talk much about being wise or a fool. Anybody want to say anything about that before I go to verse 19? Uh, yeah, um, I, I do, actually. Uh, 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 what what I was saying is when the when uh, a person thinks that they have some knowledge, that you got to be weary because you don't want to defile someone's temple, uh, but with false doctrine. So he's saying if you think you're wise in this world, then you got to become a fool. You got to lower yourself as if you know nothing. Like God teach you, and that is true wisdom to know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Let me read that in the Amplified. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool. That is, discarding his worldly pretensions and acknowledging his lack of wisdom. Yeah. So that he may become truly wise. And, uh, you know, I made that video I've mentioned a few times lately about uh, I'm seeking a new Bible teacher. And... <laughs> uh, uh, it, I did it kind of to be funny, but but also to make the point that, hey, it, uh, I need a Bible teacher. If you're somebody who understands every verse of the Bible, let me know so you can be, be our teacher. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, I didn't have anybody contact me and say, yes, I, I'm the one. I, I understand every verse of the Bible perfectly. <laughs> no takers, huh? <laughs> uh, uh, no, no takers, but uh, it seems in, in conversations and arguing with, with some people, it seems that... Um, they don't consider even the possibility that maybe they're wrong on any particular doctrine. They just think that their position is absolutely right. And I think this is this verse here is telling us, hey, let's be humble and, and, and consider that maybe I am a fool. Maybe I'm not all that smart. Maybe I don't understand everything perfectly. Maybe I better have uh, ears to hear, as James says, uh, be quick to listen, mm -hmm. slow to speak, slow to anger unfortunately that's completely reversed in the normal state of humanity and even among our friends and believers they are uh slow to listen quick to speak quick to anger yeah and uh but if we will slow down and and, and listen carefully when people disagree with us that's one of the things the beautiful thing about our congregation is that i i often have people disagree with me and i get a chance to hear a different point of view sometimes the point of view that they they're telling me though that was my old position for 25 years so i understand their position mm -hmm. but if someone has a new position that's totally foreign to me that's when i get fascinated that's when i say wow i'd like to hear more about that uh, maybe i'm wrong uh, so show me yeah all right let's go on to uh the next verse on the kjv this is uh, verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Yes. Uh, and, the Lord, and again, uh, uh, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours 
and ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. I guess all that goes together. That's why I had to say that. Um, okay, uh, Renee, uh, verse Verse 18 through 20. 19. 19. 19 through 23. 19 through 23, Renee. Okay. So the wisdom of this world is foolishness of God. We discussed this earlier, too, you know, uh, that um, the, uh, the wise, God destroys the wisdom of the wise, you know, and there's, wasn't that in this, in this book mm -hmm. we discussed? So, again, the wisdom of this world is foolishness of God. It, if, the way the world works is not the way God's kingdom works. And what you need to do to understand and achieve in this world is the exact opposite uh, in God's world. And that's why forgiving those that persecute us makes no sense to the world. You got to get justice, vengeance, you know, things of this world that seem wise is, is uh, a foolishness to God for it is written. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. I think that's in uh, Proverbs, isn't it? Um, uh, I, always, I always know it's Paul because he's, he's taking stuff out of the Proverbs and the Psalms and uh, the Old Testament Habakkuk. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. Mm -hmm. So he's like, uh, he, under, he knows what these wise people, and he's saying wise according, like earlier we were talking about the Greek philosophers Mm -hmm. go into these deep uh, philosophical thoughts, you know, mm -hmm. uh, real quick, I wanted to say I, in my philosophy class, uh, we were supposed to use one of the philosophical arguments by one of the, several of famous philosophers. Yeah. And the, the thing was, the, the thing we had to do was prove this chair exists. And uh, my whole paper was, what chair? Question mark. Turn it in. Got it. <laughs> so, it's it's that um uh because you know there's a philosopher that's like hey how do we know our perceptions how do you know that you're not seeing something different but we all call it the same you know this whole deep philosophical wisdom yeah. it's foolishness to god it really is it's yeah. the same thing with like these gurus out of hinduism if you want to have a <laughs> if you want to have a full hand you must have it empty <laughs> you yep. know this total nonsense double talking silliness yep but it sounds so deep and impressive to us so that's what comes to mind on that it's a word salad yeah okay. <laughs> all right brother Cripps. i'll read these verses in the amplified for you for the wisdom of this world is foolishness that is absurdity stupidity before god for it is written in the scriptures, he is the one who catches the wise and clever in their craftiness. Mm -hmm. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the humanly wise, that they are useless. So let no one boast in men about their wisdom or of having this or that one as a leader. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, that's Peter, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come. All things are yours, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Mm. Yeah, so for the wisdom of the world is foolishness. Now, so my favorite part of this one is uh, the one who catches the wise, God. He, God is the one that catches the wise and the clever in their own cra in their craftiness. Um, and this, to me, I've heard so many people that think they know everything there is to know about uh, different topics, and they go on and on. And um, even uh, Renee used the example of philosophy class. I went to those same philosophy classes, Renee. And um, it's, it's a fascinating topic for me because I wanted to know at that time, I wanted to know what the world's concept was about all this stuff. And I'm glad that I did because... Uh, I was able to look at that and compare it to, to Scripture and decide that for me, Scripture was the only thing that I needed to bother myself with. But it's good to know what they believe. It's, it's good to have a conversation with someone that knows the philosopher and, and uh, pitches something at you, uh, trying to confuse you, and you've already studied it and marked it off as foolishness from the world. Um, but this, how many times have you seen this happen in someone's life where 
they're clever and they're wise in their own mind, but in their own cleverness, they get to the point where they realize that they were fools the whole time. And God has the, the capability of doing that to a person. He's the only one that does. We can try over and over and over again and never convince someone who thinks they're, that they are wise uh, to change or do anything, but God can do that. He knows their thoughts and their intents. And he lets them, it's like getting a fish on the hook and letting it run for a while underneath the boat in their own wisdom, which to God is foolishness. And then eventually God will bring them into the boat. He will, um, you know, if they're his, you know, if he, if he, he uh, they, they're uh, his children, then they'll do that. But this isn't talking about that, but um, I got a little off there. Uh, but th that's the verse that means the most to me. And, and I've, I've seen it happen. Um, and then uh, verse 21, so let no one boast in men about their wisdom. This is all that stuff that we're talking about. So regardless of who it is, um, and then Paul puts it together here, and he's uh, going back to the way he started this particular chapter, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, uh, or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, nothing. I mean, there's, there's nothing. All these things are yours. Uh, and then the last one, I like the way the Amplified put it, you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. That's it. And that's it. And um, as long as we're, again, as long as we're keeping our focus on Christ, we're not uh, concerning ourselves with the philosophies of the world and what the wise men of our, our age uh, say is true, um, then we're in the right place. And that's what I uh, try to do for myself at least. Okay, thank you. I, I'm going to read the uh, NABRE uh, in the verse 19, the way they translate this. I think it's interesting. It says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in the eyes of God, for it is written, He catches the wise in their own ruses. R-U-S-E-S, -E a ruse. Or what's a ruse? It's a, like a plan to deceive someone, to trick someone, or take advantage of them. Uh, so that's interesting. I think ruses is probably a good way of looking at it there. But also, let's look at the footnote here in the ampli I mean, the uh, NABRE uh, on the verses 21 to 23. And it, it's got some interesting points that we can consider here. These verses pick up the line of thought in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13. In the Corinthians, uh, if the Corinthians were generally wise, um, their perceptions would be reversed and and they would see everything in the world and all those with whom they exist in the church in their true relationships with one another. Paul assigns all the persons involved in the theological universe a position on a scale. And this is interesting how he, they, uh, they broke this down. And the scale is God, then Christ, then church members, then church leaders, now, it says, if you read this scale from top to bottom, the scale expresses ownership. Uh, read the bottom to the top, the, the obligation to serve. Uh, that is interesting. So ownership would be God, Christ, church members, church leaders. And then in uh, in uh, um, the bottom, the obligation to serve, uh, then you have the opposite direction. You read it, uh, uh, church leaders church members, Christ, and God. Uh, I thought that was pretty interesting, but uh, I would say that the thing that we need to keep in mind, when we did the introduction, and we, we were in the first chapter, we talked about how the uh, uh, this particular city and time, uh, it had a lot of philosophers there and orators, and people were highly impressed with them. And, and that's why Paul's talking here again. You're, you think that certain people are wise, these philosophers and orators, and you know, that you're impressed with their, their wisdom, but they, they don't have real wisdom is the point he's making. Don't, don't. And, and even Peter or Paul or Apollos, you know, don't think too highly of them. And that's why the first 10 verses of chapter one, Brother Cripps pointed out to us, I think the Holy Spirit brought the, brought it to his attention. Absolutely. The first 10 verses, Jesus Christ is, is cited in all of the first 10 verses of chapter 1. So Paul is starting off by saying, Jesus, 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 over. And then he's saying, 
now you're you're elevating Peter and Paul and and, and Cephas and, Apo, and, and Apollos. Have you forgotten that this is all about Jesus? And that's why I'm saying, can we start calling ourselves Christians? Because that, that will tell everybody, look, it's not about me. It's not about Luther. It's not about Calvin. It's, it's, it's not about Rene or Luke or Matthias or any of us. It's about Christ. Yep. We identify with Christ. We rely on Christ. We worship Christ, not any uh, philosopher or church leader or person that has their face prominently on the screen here. <laughs> All right. That uh, means you, Brother Luke. Yeah. yeah I, I, didn't I include myself? If I didn't, you I'm just sorry. did. Just now you did. Okay. Uh, you said right. face prominently on the screen, and at that moment, it was you. So you included <laughs> yourself. Okay. All right. So now let's, uh, let's uh, uh, just refer to the chat room here and, and ask before we finish up, uh, does anybody in the chat room want to ask a question about the study tonight? or make a comment about the study that you would like us to respond to? If so, put it in all caps right now, and we'll take a, a minute and look at that and try to respond to it. Uh, and uh, were there any questions here that I missed or from earlier? Yeah, <coughs> it wasn't yes. in the chapter. We, we got dynamics concerned. He did the unpardonable sin, and I told him to type in my name and blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Because if he's breathing, he has not done that. Right. Blaspheming in the Holy Spirit is rejecting the witness that the Holy Spirit is bearing to you <coughs> about Jesus, what he's done and who he is. And when the people in the first century saw the miracles of Jesus and said that they were of the devil, they came from the power of the devil and not the power of God, Jesus warned them. If you keep, it's not a one-time event, honey. It's not something you can speak. I blaspheme the Holy Spirit. That's not blaspheming. No. It, it's actually rejecting the witness he's given you of Jesus. So when those people said that about Jesus, they were rejecting the witness of God working in Jesus, yeah. denying that he's the divine son of God and the promised uh, Messiah, Savior. And they refused to believe, regardless of how much uh, scripture bore witness to him, how he fulfilled the scriptures through his miracles, no matter what miraculous they saw, they refused to receive the message the Holy Spirit was trying to show them. And he said, you know, be careful because you're going to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And, and at that point, when, when God's shown you so much and you still refuse to believe you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit, you have gone to your death rejecting uh, Jesus Christ as the only way to salvation. And you have not done that, sweetheart. It's not a sin. It's not any old sin. Mm -hmm. This is going to your grave, rejecting no matter how much evidence the Holy Spirit shows you that Jesus alone is Savior and who he is. And you just say, nope, not having it. That's blasphemy in the Holy Spirit, and it is unforgivable because you're dead. And uh, it's given once for man to die, then the judgment. So that's what it yeah. means. Good. Dynamics, I think, is only 13 years old. And I'm proud of him for caring about spiritual things at that age. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So if there's no other uh, questions or uh, thoughts from the chat room for us to respond to, let me uh, take some time here to uh, get, make our final remarks here. Um, let me ask our Brother Cripps first. Uh, what were your... Uh, summary thoughts of the the time tonight yeah thank you brother luke uh yeah so my summary thoughts would be again i love what paul does he keeps hitting the same points again and again and uh the point for uh tonight seemed to be let's not focus on who brought us in let's focus on uh the the fact that uh god brings the increase let's keep our eyes on uh the person we need to keep our eyes on which is christ that's what that that's what um I believe is at the center of the Christian life. It's all about what Christ did and nothing else. Um, but we don't add anything to it. We we come to the cross uh, alone with our sin, and we leave the cross being sanctified uh, by Christ himself and his finished work, what he did uh, for us. And uh, we don't enter into it at all. Um, I, I'm really enjoying this study. Uh, I, I love Romans, but this one's... Uh, this one's uh, becoming a favorite as well. So I look forward to next week 
and uh, good night to the chat. Okay, thank you, Brother Cripps. Uh, uh, Sister Renee, yeah, give us really, your, your thoughts. Brother Cripps, that, that's so awesome, dude. I It's like I, we study a book, and then I'm like, oh, gosh, it's my favorite. And we go to the next one, it's like, this might be my favorite. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? And I love it, too, because it goes over so many doctrines, yeah. so many issues. Mm -hmm. And I like mm -hmm. that this is really confirming that the foundation must <clears throat> But your works will be rewarded if you serve God once you're saved. And you still, uh, you know, should be doing that. But this really says bring the focus back to Jesus. You know, everything he's addressing here, foundation is Jesus. Uh, the body of Christ is all Jesus. Even the workers, we are all one in Jesus. Uh, can't be divided. And uh, it, this, this chapter really points to everything being jesus yeah and uh it's so unfortunate so many really do uh think have their foundation on filthy rags because th their works can't even be wood hair stubble because they can't achieve any type of good work at all right um and uh because it, it's worthless if you're not in christ it's not possible to yeah. do anything good unless you're in jesus all about jesus y'all Amen. All about Jesus. Amen. Okay. Uh, I'd like to also take the, uh, uh, give an opportunity to Brother Matthias, who's, who's been with us all night behind the scenes, uh, orchestrating everything. And uh, not only thank you, Brother, but, uh, you know, I'm sure you've been listening and paying attention all the time. So I'd like to also give you an opportunity, if you want to, to give a summary of, of your thoughts on the talk tonight. Would you like to do that? like this and I believe everybody can hear me but yeah the topic the today's discussion was awesome um, I like following along with you guys really going in depth uh, especially using the three different versions um, tonight's discussion about uh, you know the harvest and the increase and I mean just I agree with uh, uh, Renee and Jason that as you read through a book uh, it does become your favorite so I got 66 favorites just depends on which one I'm in right now so no I appreciate it uh, being a part and I hope that the uh, I hope that the presentation is uh, coming across good for you guys out there in the chat room <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, probably about a month, a couple months ago, Brother Cripps brought up an idea. He says uh, on the Wednesday study, since there's only Renee and and Cripps and myself, that maybe we shouldn't mute so that we could be free to interact a little bit more freely uh, because we don't have to worry about audio feedback if someone doesn't mute. So uh, we've adopted that, uh, and now I, I'm, I'm muted for some reason, and... Uh, but uh, so I forgot. I'm so used to not muting on this program on Wednesdays. <laughs> <clears throat> but the, the thing that really sticks in my mind is the verse that talks about destroying and, and the idea that uh, the person who's destroying is actually the common, someone that's coming into the congregation and trying to destroy uh, the, the, the doctrines. Uh, the false teachers coming in and destroy the foundational doctrine that about Jesus being the foundation. And, um, and that's happening today. We have people come in all the time to our chat rooms and, and, and these Bible studies are not for the false teachers uh, to come in and try to tear down our core doctrines. Uh, if they want to come in and listen, uh, ask questions, that's fine. But, but for them to try to come in and argue against the core doctrines, uh, this is not the place. If you want to do that, contact Matthias on Talk and Doctrine, and he'll be glad to have debates and dialogues with you about that. But this is a Bible study for the congregation and people who are seeking and want to learn. Uh, so we don't want to have people come in trying to destroy the foundation. The foundation is uh, Jesus is eternal God Almighty. He came down from heaven and became a man so he could die for our sins. 
his death on the cross paid for our sins. So now uh, we can have eternal life by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and we can never lose it. Once we believe in Jesus, we have eternal security. So that, that's the, the core doctrines. That's the foundation. And if, if someone wants to come in and attack and destroy that foundation, this scripture tells us that God will destroy the destroyer. Let that be a warning to all the false teachers out there, all the lordship heretics that want to try to destroy the foundation of, of uh, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. If you're trying to destroy it, God's going to destroy you, according to the scripture we covered tonight. So let's, uh, uh, that, that's my final thoughts on this. And the last thing I want to say to everybody is that, um, uh, the Wednesday Bible study and the Sunday church program are pretty rigidly structured. And uh, we, we limit the panelists to a, a select few that are always on the program. It's not open panel. But the Friday uh, fellowship program, uh, which will happen this Friday at 930 Eastern time, uh, it's an open panel. So all believers are welcome to join. And it's very casual. And, uh, and that's the way that we want it. We, it's not too structured and we talk about whatever we want to and mostly it's to have fellowship, a praise and worship reports. And uh, you know, we can, we can discuss theology too, but it's very, uh, it's not structured and rigid the way the Wednesday and Sunday program is. So I invite you all to join us Friday at 9.30 Eastern time for that. And I guess, um, yeah, I guess I have nothing else to say. So. Thanks to everybody, Sister Renee, Brother Cripps, Brother Matthias, all the saints in the chat room. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.